get started here. Um, we'll let, wait for everybody else to get caught or uh, to catch up here. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll start off by talking about syllabus and how this is going to go. Um, I know that uh, fully virtual is not what anybody was, was hoping for when it comes to OCHEM and lab skills. Um, I'm still going to try to keep it pretty relevant to, to you guys. I, I think most of you, so Elke, you're pre-PA, right? Um, Hava's in the life, life sciences. Hey, Cody. Oh, I'll wait for him. Hey, Cody. Hey, Sean. And Adam is connecting here. Awesome. Um, Olivia, are you in life sciences too, in pre-health pre in some way? Uh, Pre-PA as well. Pre-PA, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try and keep the labs is even though they're virtual and we're going to be somewhat limited, I'm going to try and keep them pretty um, relevant to, to life sciences because most of you guys are life sciences. Um, and I'm going to open this, the, the option up for anybody who wants the actual physical lab skills. I know there's a few people that are um, talking about, about going a uh, chemistry major route and are worried about not getting lab skills in lab. Um, next year, if you are still here, um, we have the option to do and have you audit the um, in-person labs for for no credit, no cost. Um, you would just get to show up and do the labs with the class from next year. So anybody who feels like they missed up missed out on the physical labs and are still around Tahoe and wants to do that, um, that's an option that uh, we'll be able to talk about as we get a little bit closer. Um, so Sorry. I'm going to try and keep. Do you think um, this whole year is going to be? Uh, virtual? At least fall and winter. Um, spring is still a little bit up in the air. I, I, I really like us to be able to do that, but um, until we get some more, some more hard um, news about um, a vaccine and how it's being deployed is the biggest issue, is even if we manage to have a vaccine by March, um, we need better than 70% of the people in Tahoe to get it in order to have, to have herd immunity. Um, and so I, it's up in the air. It's, I put it at about 50, 50 right now, frankly. Um, we'll still try, like I said, I'll still try and give you guys some good skills. And if you're pre health, you know, the odds that you guys are actually going to need to, you know, do a steam distillation or, and you know, a, a chem chemical extraction of some sort or recrystallization is pretty low for, for most people. Um, that's not something that, that is really going to be uh, in your wheelhouse unless you're working in an organic chemistry lab on a regular basis. Um, maybe there might be some skills that would touch on if you went into research in a biochem field, um, but you're not even going to miss out too much there. So we'll get a lot of the the theory that that you guys would wind up using in more of a bio biochem field. Um, and frankly, almost everything is done by computer these days anyway when it comes to lab skills unless you're in organic synthesis is your area of expertise, you're not really going to be missing out on, on too much that way. Um, and I will also try as try my, my darndest to avoid lobster. Um, I was not a big fan of lobster. I know that there were a lot of issues with lobster. There's going to be a few, a few labs that for OCHEM, the lobster actually does something that's a little bit different than what we could do in person. And it's a little bit more interesting than just doing one, another worksheet. Um, so I think there'll be one or two weeks where you guys have, have to do a couple lobster simulations in a, in a row over the course of the week. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to limit that as much as possible um, because I know that's not everybody's idea of a good time. Um, even if they're a little bit more interesting sometimes. Um, but let me go ahead and get the slides started. That's not the right window. Hang on. So that uh, power outage that we had last Thursday, um, it fried my entire computer. I was using an old surge protector and the power surge just killed my desktop. Um, and so I have parts on the way, but I haven't put it, put them together yet. So I'm using, running this all off of a tiny laptop right now. Um, that's not my normal computer. So give me a second to figure out which, there we go. And screen share. All right, we're looking good, right? Okay. 
All right, so let's go ahead and, and get into this a little bit. Um, we're going to be using a lot of the same skills that, you, that we used last spring if you guys were here at LTCC when it comes to um, using Zoom. Um, office hours are going to be Zoom. The lecture will be, I will be in pretty much all of the lab meeting times in Zoom. I just turn on my Zoom meeting and I hang out here if, whether you guys, um, whether people are there or not, same for office hours. Um, for the labs, you guys are probably going to want to, to be there. Um, there will be at least a few labs where I need to give you guys a, a quick um, you know, mini lecture on some of the theory that we're going to be going over if we haven't gotten to some of the, the theory in lecture yet. Um, so you're definitely going to want to show up to the labs as much as possible. If we are doing one of those mini lectures, though, in, in lab, I will um, do my best to remember to record it and post it to YouTube later. Um, so that if you aren't able to be there in person or in real time, synchronously, as we're saying now, um, that uh, you'll be able to catch up later and those links will all get posted as, as they um, make their way to YouTube, which does take a little bit of time, so it won't be right away. Um, we'll, we'll have a fairly small group. I think there are 10 of you guys enrolled in this class right now, um, so we won't need too much, um, too much need for breakout rooms. Um, in fact, my the chat window ran away from me. So let me grab that back up. Um, I will do my best to also make sure I'm paying attention to who's using the raise hands function in in Zoom and uh, talking in the chat as best I can. Sometimes as I'm doing screen share and stuff, those things um, get lost behind other windows. So just if I feel like I'm um, missing you on that one. Um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and just uh, interrupt a little bit because sometimes I do just plain out miss it when people are talking in the chat. Um, you guys have the benefit of I at least have a, a quarter of Zoom experience um, teaching under my belt at this point. So um, you guys, I, I should be getting better at this by now. Um, and for the most part, the labs will be somewhat self self-paced in terms of you start them on Monday, they'll, they'll all go live on Monday and you can, you know, check them out, read over it a little bit, maybe try some of it if you, if you can understand what the lab's asking. Um, and then, you know, show up Tuesday for our lab meeting and we can go over any, any pitfall, pitfalls or questions that you have. Um, I think Mariola and I are going to do um, a, a few demo labs. I don't really like the idea of doing that too much because I don't want you guys to, you know, how exciting is it for you guys to sit and watch a YouTube video of me setting up a lab for you and then watching something boil. That's even more boiling than watching something boil in real life, right? Um, but there will be a few, a few times where we do some sort of a demo lab and then I'll have you do a write up of some sort where you're, you know, you explain the purpose of the different pieces of glassware or answer a couple questions. Um, but I'll try to make those tolerable. Um, I'll at least fast forward the watch something boil part. Um, so we'll, but uh, it's kind of going to be on a week by week basis, depending on what's been working, what's, what is available, what material we're covering. Um, I'm not going to, you know, shackle myself into using the exact same lab um, protocol for all 11 weeks because we, frankly don't know what's going to work well with with you guys different groups do things differently and I haven't done o this part of OCHEM um, online yet. Um, if we do wind up in the um, second quarter, um, I actually have some really good labs um, because my my research in grad school was actually in computational organic chemistry. Um, so I'm going to actually I'll actually teach you guys some of the basics for um, running computations on, on um, they call them clusters. They're sort of like a server, but designed to run um, chemistry calculations or supercomputer calculations. Um, so they're, you know, the, a cluster would be maybe six, six, eight feet tall with a bunch of, of uh, racks in it that all have, you know, like 12 processors and 30 gigs of RAM per rack. Um, and there's some of those that we can run on for free online. And, uh, and so I'll teach you guys some of the basics for that and why it's why computational chemistry is useful, that sort of thing. Um, and we can actually talk about uh, the big, anybody know what the big um, discovery that was announced yesterday in Nature? Anybody read about that yet? It's kind of late in the day. 
Um, so not everybody might have seen it. So there's uh, evidence, fairly strong evidence of uh, microscopic life in the clouds in Venus. Um, there's they were looking for what they call a, a biosignature gas, which is something that is unstable enough in the environment of that planet um, that we should only see it if there's something producing it on an ongoing basis, um, aka microscopic life in a, um, possibly in this case. And so in the case of Earth, Earth's biosignature gas would be oxygen. Oxygen's unstable enough that over the course of a thousand years, all of, the earth, all of the oxygen on Earth should decompose and break down and oxidize various minerals um, and metals and things like that. So that we, unless there was life on Earth, you shouldn't see any oxygen on Earth. And so phos phosphine, PH3, um, is a gas similar under the highly oxidizing conditions on Venus. Um, you shouldn't see any significant concentration of phosphine, um, but this, this group um, was, they were not even really expecting to find anything. They were you gonna use it as just sort of like calibrating their telescope um, and they got a signal for phosphine that they weren't expecting. And so either there's one of two things is possible. Either there's something, some form of life that's producing this phosphine gas in the clouds in Venus, or we fundamentally don't understand the chemistry of Venus. Both of those are really exciting. Um, because it means that there's some really, really good big science that's going to happen in the next few years there. Um, and so one of the things that they did, though, is before they could publish this paper, because, you know, anytime you're a scientist, especially an astronomer who's publishing things that say life on another planet is a possibility, you want to make sure that you've ruled out as many other options as possible so that, it, you know, a week later, somebody doesn't say, oh, you're an idiot. Um, you forgot to account for this. Um, and so they actually ran a bunch of these calculations in environment, then simulated environments like Venus's clouds, um, which are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, um, which is kind of hardcore and metal all on its own. Um, this, this, this bacteria might live in clouds of sulfuric acid. Um, but they ran these calculations that predict, yeah, no, we, as far as we're aware, the phosphine should not be present under these conditions. Um, so we'll be able to run some similar calculations to what they were doing. Um, we'll focus more on the organic side than on the phosphorus based side, but just really cool stuff. So keep an eye on that. Um, don't believe the headlines that say life discovered. We're not quite there yet, but it's pretty very exciting um, evidence. You know, it's not very often that in my spare time, I sit in my, in my bed in my, Bedtime reading is a nature article. I'm not that sciencey and nerdy most of the time, but last night I was. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I I saw a headline some like late afternoon yesterday at some point, but I didn't pay much attention to it because you see those kind of headlines all the time. And then I actually saw some analysis by an astronomer. I'm like, oh, this was a big deal. Um, so when you get a chance this week, go ahead and uh, and check that out. Anyway, back back on topic a little bit. Um, this these are some common questions from um, from a discussion board from last spring for my intro to Gen Chem students, um, but they're most of them are still relevant here. If you do miss class, you won't be necessarily marked down um, unless you also miss an assignment that went along with it. But all the assignments will show up on Canvas. And um, you guys should be able to see um, the calendar. If you guys haven't played around with the calendar on Canvas yet, let me pull up my um, Canvas calendar so you guys can see what that looks like and do a quick demonstration. So mine looks like a mess because I've got lots of different courses going on. Um, when you get, um, when you get, to the home page, yours will look a little different because uh, you won't have all the options here. But over on the right hand side, where in that area where it says coming up, let's see what, if it gives me the option for the calendar in. So, oh, there it is, very, view course calendar. Um, all of the different, and you should see multiple options over here on the right for different calendars. Um, and for the different classes that you have, but it, it, anything with a due date, 
that I've pu hit publish on will show up on here. So this will be your way to make sure that you don't miss anything. That in the to-do list on, um, on the homepage is also, I found it pretty helpful. Um, my to-do list as the instructor when I'm not in student view just has a list of all the things I need to grade. So it reminds me that I'm getting behind on grading. Um, but uh, it's, and I will try to keep up on that as best I can. Um, but no, there's not a grade reduction. Just make sure that you don't miss any assignments. And then all the, all the videos will be posted to the uh, various um, week one, week two. So I'll post the slides as soon as I'm done with them. Um, since this is the second time I've taught this class, the slides should be available right around the end of business, the day before your class. Um, no guarantees though, because sometimes if I need to do a lot on the slides, a lot of work on the slides, I won't have a chance to get them all the way finished until later in the evening. Um, but they will be posted before lecture starts. If it's like 7.30 in the morning, day of lecture, and you don't see the slides posted, um, shoot me an email or mention it when you first log into Zoom because I probably just forgot to post them. Um, so, but that, you have access to the PDFs as those of you who've had my classes before should be used to that by now. Um, and then the video links will show up as soon as it's kind of a long process because I need to um, wait for Zoom to finish rendering it, download it to my computer, upload it to YouTube, um, wait for YouTube to finish rendering it, and then I can get the link and post it. So it kind of takes about an hour after lecture. Um, and on Tuesdays, I do all my teaching on Tuesdays and Thursdays this quarter. I teach on Tuesdays starting 8 a.m. I go pretty much straight through until 6.30, until the end of our lab. Um, I have two half hour breaks in there. And so your lecture videos might not be posted until Wednesday um, with that in mind. Um, I'll do my best, but things get hectic, um, especially with uh, two little kids running around as well um, that are being homeschooled and needing things and you know they want crazy stuff like to eat um so, so occasionally i'll have to stop and take care of that in the middle of the day so um calculators aren't going to matter that much um for this class ochem's just not heavy on calculations um basically it's going to be things like percent yield calculations um so some stoichiometry and some percentages is going to be the, the, the extent of the math for this class for the most part um, we will talk about much more complicated math, um, but I won't have you actually do the run the calculations yourself. It'll be in the context of, then they do this crazy thing called a Fourier transform, and then we get this spectrum out of it, and then we can read, we can learn to read the spectrum, what the instruments will actually be, be doing. Um, so we won't need that too much. Um, if you don't have cam scanner still installed on your phone, should go ahead and grab that again. Um, or if you're never, never got familiar with it, it's really, really helpful for distance learning when it comes to saving and submitting things as PDFs. Um, just make sure you get a scanner app that's not spyware. Some of them are really, really sketchy looking. Um, if you get one that's, uh, that's web page looks like it's from the 1990s with all sorts of neon colors and you know gradients that look like they were made in MS Paint, um, that's probably not a good one. Um, Cam Scanner does kind of continually hit you up for money, but it doesn't really have that much limitations in the free version. Um, so that's the one that I recommend. But anything like that, that where you can do it, um, save things as a PDF. The other way that you can do this that and not might not occur to everybody is you can always take pictures with your phone and then. Um, or with whatever camera you have, and then paste it into a Microsoft Word document, um, is a, and then save the Word document as a PDF, um, or just as a Word document for that matter, is a little bit better than submitting five to five JPEGs as your assignment for these. But I think most of you guys have had some experience turning stuff in online, so you guys are, are there. Um, but there are other options if you run into any tech issues, just let me know. Um, and this is just plain out. I did not change that one from, from last fall. You guys are not using the Chem Wiki and McMurray at all um, for the intro to Gen Chem class. Um, you guys are using Klein, which, let me pull the um, text, open up the textbook. There is a digital version 
floating around out there. Um, and I, I definitely would not do something like um, Google Klein Organic Chemistry Third Edition and and find a, a copyright violation PDF on the internet. That's definitely not something that I would do, but I won't impose my morals on you. Um, that's definitely not where I got this one that says pdflobby.com on it. Um, but it, and it will be the same textbook for all three quarters. Um, I think last, last fall, um, somebody posted, posted the link in the discussion board and I, I had to, to do my due diligence and remove it after, after a week. RJ, did you have a question? Um, I did. I, I went online yesterday to, <clears throat> to try and look for a hard copy of the book. Um, but they range from like three dollars to 120 to like 300 and so i wasn't exactly sure like if you had a suggestion on a site that'll get it here within a good amount of time um i would so i would go with amazon you still need to watch out for your seller and and make sure you get that their way they publish this one is really weird even the publisher's site i couldn't actually find the isbn that matched yeah exactly yeah me I too want. and that's that's why i was having a hard time and i was like is this exactly the one that he wants or not you know like i wasn't sure the, the second edition of Klein should be pretty, you know, your page numbers and, and problem numbers might not match up exactly, um, but it should be pretty, pretty close to the same thing. This is just a textbook, uh, you know, especially in a field like organic chemistry, these textbooks, you know, th they've been a dominant textbook in these mm -hmm. areas for 50 years. There's been the three organic chem textbooks and Klein is not one of those. Okay. Um, and so there, it's a little bit harder to find than some of the others, but I like the way it's written, the way it's, it's designed a lot better. Um, so if you're, anybody's trying to order it and you're not sure if it's the right one, just shoot me an email with a screenshot and I can, and I'll, I'll vet it for you. Um, the book, sh the bookstore does have a link that should work as well, but they're all going to be to new ones that are pretty pricey. Um, and they're then, if, on, sorry, they're also on back order. That doesn't surprise me either. Um, like I said, we're using the textbook that not many OCHEM classes use, not as many use. And so it's, you know, they don't have as many of them floating around. Um, but, you know, as long as you're getting something, there's, I think the loose leaf version um, is, is more common and that's something like 90 bucks. You need a binder to put it in because it just comes as a shrink wrapped, you know, a thousand shrink wrapped pages. Um, it's like, a little bit more than a ream of paper. So you'll need a, a binder to put it in. Um, but um, that people have had pretty good results with that one. Um, and as long as the cover looks, has says organic chemistry by Klein, what you don't want is Klein also does an introduction to organic chemistry. You don't want the intro version. You want the one that's just plain out organic chemistry. Um, and anybody who, who needs additional resources when it comes to technology side, um, then we do have a Chromebook lending program um, for anybody who, who needs a, a better laptop. Oh, if you're doing this on your phone right now, um, that's probably not, not gonna work for this whole quarter. You're gonna want a, a better notebook. Um, but we do have a Chromebook lending program um, that still has a fair number of computers. So anybody who needs it can um, just email me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with, uh, with Kenya and the instruction office who's, who is running that and keeping track of the, the list there. Um, we will have some tutoring, which have any of you guys had any success doing um, tutoring online yet? Have you guys tried that last, Olivia? Good. Um, yeah, I use it like crazy and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, the Cranium Cafe with us. Oh, no, I've always used um, through my old college. Uh, it's probably a pretty similar format, though. Yeah, if you go to, to the LTCC website and then over, it gets a little bit hard to find sometimes. If you go over to the virtual campus side, I think it's under student support. Um, I think you can actually get to it by going through the, so if you scroll down, um, if you click on make an appointment, in chat, actually, it takes it takes you to, the, to Cranium Cafe, which has basically a, it's a whole bunch of virtual offices, 
and you can see the instruction office, the counselors. This just has the counselors. I thought it had everybody. Um, da -da -da. It should log you in. Well, and I don't actually know what the office hours or the hours are going to be for our tutors anyway, but we will have a chemistry tutor and it will be um, somebody who's passed OCHEM here with us before. Um, it's probably either Mattia or Erina um, will be the chemistry tutor this year. Um, if you know them, if you remember them from last year when we, you know, used to know people in person. Um, and then we'll have some, uh, you know, a couple hours that probably don't match up. We're going to try to spread them out so it doesn't match up with my office hours. So if I'm not in my office hours and you can't get a hold of me, there's a better chance that you should be able to show up to Cranium Cafe. And I got to find out exactly where they moved our um, um links for the tutors there but we'll get get that taken care of um it's weird working at home i have my office set up pretty well i've got a nice whiteboard behind me now so i'm not like crawling around on the ground like last year um trying to draw things but my kids are also around um that's dashel that's valence those are my animals tonks and pippy and my wife laura is sharing my office as well um so there's, there's a lot going on in our household on any given day. Um, so there's a fairly strong chance that you guys will get to know these, these folks pretty well. Um, and I'll try to keep it professional. My wife's out in the other room with my son doing his homeschool since today is my heavy, heavy day for teaching, but you never know what's gonna happen. So a um, little, uh, little understanding when it comes to, to that, I'll try to keep it as professional as possible. Um, my son got really into playing Dungeons and Dragons with uh, miniatures and dice and everything over the summer. Um, and then this just captures my daughter's personality kind of in general. She's kind of 110% all the time about everything. Um, so if you hear, if you hear very loud yelling in the background, um, that's probably just my daughter being upset or excited about something. Um, the animals other than the occasional cat walking across, you shouldn't see them too much. Uh, we will still be doing the weekly quizzes. I think those are kind of more important than ever. Now that we're, we're virtual, you guys don't, aren't gonna have the time to ask me in person as much um, to go over problems. So the quizzes will go, go live Thursday afternoons and then you'll have to take them before Sunday at midnight. So the whole idea is just that you can't go Thursday to Tuesday without thinking about chemistry. So even if you got all your assignments done, I'm going to specifically time it so that you have to come back and think about chemistry over the weekend at some point. Um, and that's, there's a lot of research that shows that uh, that, that helps with retention. Um, and then it'll also kind of give you guys some, some practice with test taking because these will be kind of standard multiple choice questions. Maybe draw some structures and upload a picture of it sort of questions. Um, over the summer, I spent a lot of time thinking about whether I was doing you guys favors by um, not teaching you guys test taking strategies by making my, my tests all completely non multiple choice, all free response which is really good for me to assess how well you guys know the stuff, um, but might be doing you a disservice in that you don't know how to take a multiple choice test about chemistry um, because you've never had one. And if you go to a four year school, that's a bigger school, you're gonna have to learn how to do that um, at some point because if you go into a, um, you know, a pharmacology class that has 150 people, you're probably gonna be taking a multiple choice test. Um, or if you're taking the MCAT or what's the, what's the uh, test for PA school? What do they use? Some use GRE and some are starting to use this thing called the PA CAT, but um, a lot of programs don't require either right now. If you take the, the GRE, that's actually, um, that's probably ideal for most of you because it actually is not content dependent. It's um, in terms of like, it's not, doesn't have a biology section um, like the MCAT. So there won't be any, any, um, OCHEM on it, but if you if you take PA CAT or the MCAT, then there's going to be organic chemistry on it. So we'll get some practice. Like this is how a multiple choice question would be written um, for for organic chemistry. And uh, the textbook actually has some um, has some practice problems after the challenge problems at the end of each chapter. Um, the there's a section usually anyway 
so not in chapter one, apparently. Um, that's basically, they say it, it's in the style of the ACS tests. Oh, there they are. Um, follow the style of the ACS organic chemistry exam. The ACS is the American Chemical Society. Um, and the, the ACS, basically, they're, they have standardized tests for all the major chemistry related courses. So there's a, an ACS Gen Chem test. That's basically the SAT for Gen Chem. Everybody in the entire um, country at big schools will take the same test at the end of the year. Um, and they do the same thing for organic chemistry. Um, but they're gonna be pretty similar to the sort of questions you would see in an MCAT or any other subject dependent standardized test, you know, where it's multiple choice, A, B, C, D. Um, and so we'll do, we'll do some of these for practice as well. And I'll, I'll straight up steal some of these for the quiz questions too. Um, which also brings me to the solutions manual. Um, the solutions manual for this, for this um, textbook is available online as well. I think it's, it's like 70 or 80 bucks for the, for the loose leaf version. Um, I have a copy of it. The, my normal approach would be to have you guys um, check it out. If you want it, if we were in person, just come to my office hours, you can check it out, just bring it back by the end of the day sort of thing. Um, since that's not an option, anybody who want, if you want to see the solutions manual for a specific set of problems, um, email me and I'll, I'll scan it real quick and make a PDF and send it off to you. I'm probably not going to do that for the entire solutions manual for every chapter because it's, you know, like 300 pages. Um, but if you do have um, any specific questions or if I assign some homework problems and, and I want you guys to have the solutions manual for them, um, then I will, I will make that available or you can get your own copy if you want, if you want to be able to go through all these. Um, let's be realistic, not, not all of them, but if you wanted to be able to go through them at, at your own pace or pick your own problems. Um, we'll also continue to do little icebreakers, at least a little bit, um, have you guys come up with questions in your quizzes about random organic chemistry topics. Um, and we will, will address those, you know, or you guys tend to, what I've seen from last year is that there are a lot more questions on the content we've covered in OCHEM because you guys are trying to keep up a little bit more than Gen Chem. Gen Chem, if you're strong at the math and you stay on top of things, you know, it's not that bad. It's a lot of work, but the, the concepts weren't that tricky for the most part. Um, once you got your head wrapped around a couple big concepts. Um, so but do we are still going to have the ask Sean a random question section on the quiz. So um, still feel free to throw that in there. Um, and then just reminder, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Fixed mindset, also called a deficit model, is that idea that people are either good at one thing or bad at it. People are good at math or bad at math. They're good at English or they're bad at English. Um, and that's the sort of attitude that, that a lot of students come into chemistry with. I just can't get chemistry. Chemistry is just really hard for me. Um, I'm, that's not actually how your mind works. And just switching your mindset to what's called a growth mindset, where you remind yourself that with practice, you're going to get better at things. I'm not good at organic chemistry yet. Um, math it gives me a problem right now. Or, you know, I'm working on getting better at writing, um, as opposed to just I'm not good at writing. So at the very least, anytime when you guys come to office hours, if you feel you, you know, you want to start a sentence with, I just can't get the hang of hybridization. Stick yet on the end. It's a little thing, um, but it kind of helps you start to think like, okay, this is something I can get the hang of. This is something that I will understand. I just need to, to think about it more. I just need to change how I'm thinking about something. All right. So just remind yourself, always add yet to the end of those kind of sentences. Um, I will use random memes. We will throw some memes in there. Um, there's actually some really good organic chemistry memes as we get in there. Plus you guys have enough science background. You can actually understand some, some chemistry memes now. Um, and uh, sometimes they're actually helpful for, for understanding things. Um, you guys real, um, do you guys know about the history of the word meme? actually from, um, from a biologist, an evolutionary biologist um, named Richard Dawkins, who um, 
who said basically he's, it's the information equivalent to a gene. A gene is a, is a discrete piece of information in your genetic code. A meme is a discrete piece of information as an idea. So it's an abstract version of a gene um, that, that can move from one person to another, similar to the way that you can pass on genes from one, one individual to another. Um, and so that's actually why, why it's called a meme. And there's actually an entire field of study called memetics, like genetics, but with memes, um, where they study the information science, how information and ideas are transmitted from one person or one group of people to another. So most technology could be considered a meme, like the idea of using a wheel back in Stone Age times, that would have been a meme. It would have started in one place and then gradually spread out because you see somebody using a wheelbarrow and you've been carrying rocks on your back for your entire life that wheelbarrow is going to seem like a really good idea, right? And then all of a sudden your group has the meme. Um, Can I ask so a are, question about that? Yeah. So do you know which came first, like this version of a meme or the idea and the name of meme? Like which? The idea and the, the name of a meme. I think Dawkins put it forth sometime in the, in the late 90s. Oh, okay. All right. And then in pretty early on in internet culture, it got, it got uh, co-opted and just means, you know, something with white letters, a picture with white letters right. across the bottom now. Okay. Um, but it is still useful for understanding and kind of like reminding yourself certain concepts. So we'll, we'll use those where, where appropriate and where entertaining. Um, we won't need goggles. We won't need lab coats. Um, your grades are posted on the canvas or the uh, the um, structure of the class is posted on Canvas. Um, if you go to, open it up in student view, if you go to syllabus or to assignments, it'll tell you how everything is weighted. So you guys are 30% of your grade is going to be assignments, which is going to be the lab. This is going to be homework. Any assignment that's not a quiz or an exam is going to go into assignments. Um, and the, then there's the quizzes, which we'll be doing every week and the exams, um, the lab final last year was a comprehensive lab write up. Um, this year will be, we're basically going to treat do it like journal club. If you had chem 103 with Carl, um, it's going to be kind of similar to that. Um, there will be some deadlines in the middle of the quarter though. So it, in at the end of October, so about a month from now, um, your assignment that week, in addition to reviewing for the exam, is going to be to come up with four possible journal articles. And I'll give you some more information about what, what I want you to be looking for in these articles when we get closer. Um, but it's going to be peer reviewed stuff. It's going to, you know, it's got to be at least kind of related to um, chemistry. Yeah. Um, JSTOR is actually free until the end of December which okay. is a great resource for um, peer-reviewed articles. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we'll use some of, the, some of those sources like that. And the other thing that we'll talk about too is that it's, if it's something that doesn't have an open access or that we don't have access to from our school, um, and there's an article, one of the reasons I have you submit these articles is that, is that I will be, go, be able to go through and look at them and actually get you access where relevant. I have access to about 50 articles a um, a year with my ACS membership um, that, to any of the ACS journal, family of journals. Um, and so once we pick an article, once we read the abstracts, and that's part of your assignment for that one is to talk them over with me and we'll kind of pick one together um, or pick a couple for you to read and, and figure out what you want to do with that. Um, then we will, then I'll make sure that you have access to it. And even if it's not ACS, um, Carl and Melanie, Melanie Chu is the librarian. Um, Director of Library Services, I think is her official title at the school. Um, she, she helps us get, get access to any of the PDFs that we need to that our school doesn't have access to the entire journal as well. Um, so you shouldn't be limited by that really. We'll be able to get you access to any of these articles that you want um, as we get a little bit closer. Um, we try not to call in all of our favors at once on that one though. That's why I have you kind of, you know, we'll pick and choose the article and then we'll get you access to it if needed. Um, but you know, some, some things that have been done in the past are things like, let me see if I have from OCHEM 3 real quick, what their, everybody's research projects were. 
um, with stuff like a um, uh, student named Christine Leon did a, a read about a uh, study that looked at okra toxin in coffee. Okra toxin is a toxin that shows up in um, commercially available coffee grounds. Um, and she was looking at, and it's not regulated in the US, but it is in Europe. And so she was looking at the detection of okra toxin in coffee. Um, you know, we have things like finding um, the components that could be, that could conceivably in, react together in interstellar medium, meaning the area between stars, um, that could conceivably react together spontaneously to form a guanine, you know, a, uh, which is a um, genetic base, a DNA base. Um, and she looked at the actual calculations that were done and stuff like that. And so there's, there's lots of good stuff here. Um, Corinne did hers on, she had several possibilities she wanted to read through. She did one about the synthesis of ketamine. Um, and then she actually, the paper she actually wound up presenting was on um, synthesis in a lab of psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms. Um, and so there's a lot of different options, different places you can go. You can go biochem related route. You can go a pure synthesis route where you're just looking at what the different steps would be. Um, you can go a computational route where they actually just calculate some of these numbers. Um, but there are lots of good, good options there. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Hava. Um, so I'll post this, this link um, to create a JSTOR account as we get a little closer there too. So you guys can, JSTOR is, is a um, pretty big library of peer-reviewed journals um, that include some chemistry journals as well as lots of other, if I'm remembering JSTOR properly, it's interdisciplinary, so it's got a lot of different fields as well. Yeah, I used it for my honors thesis at UCLA. Perfect. Yeah, there's there's a few of those good, really good databases. The ACS kind of maintains their own, that has like 50 different chemistry-related journals as well um, that I have access to a set number of of those. Um, so attendance is going to be weird. Homework is going to be homework. Attendance, I'm not going to take attendance, but it's a good idea. I really like that you guys are all here with your cameras on. There's nothing more disheartening for me than to have 50 people in, in a Zoom meeting and not one turns their camera on um, because it just feels like I'm talking to myself. Um, you know, Instructors appreciate little things like the fact that you guys are sitting there muted, but still nodding your head occasionally like that little bit of human interaction that that means a lot to us. So thanks for showing up having your cameras on. Please continue to do that. Um, I understand that you might need to turn your camera off to go get yourself your coffee or, you know, take a break, brush your teeth, that kind of thing this early in the morning. But um, I really appreciate you guys being here and having those cameras turned on. Um, you guys are all good enough students. I don't need to remind you not to cheat. Um, it's really easy doing this virtually, um, but your, your instructors are pretty, pretty clever too. I found, caught at least, at least half a dozen people in my Chem 100 class last spring that turned in some, you know, problems to a test version that they didn't have on the final, um, just because I didn't tell them there were multiple versions of the test. Um, and so they, you know, just turned in their friend's work. Um, so you know, I'm still going to put measures in place to try and prevent that, but I know you guys um, are all good enough students that I don't need to worry about that too much. Just, in, you know, remember when you're working on things together and in groups, which I expect you guys to do and want you guys to do, um, if you're turning something in, it means that you understand it. If you turn something in that you don't understand what you did, what you drew, or why you drew it, um, that's that's sort of where I draw the line on where group work becomes unacceptable. So, and if I'm ever unsure about whether or not you were, you just copied somebody else's answers, um, my, the way that I address that is just to, um, I have you do it with me. I have you start over from scratch from a blank piece of paper um, and, you know, have you actually work your way through the problem with me watching you. And if you can't do that, if you don't even have a way to start, um, then that's not a good thing. And we have to decide where to go from there. Um, but I know that won't be an issue in this class. Just make sure that you don't copy and paste stuff. Make sure that you understand what you're doing and why. 
you're turning in those answers, but working in groups is absolutely allowed and encouraged. So Sean, yeah. are you planning on having our, um, what was it, our final like journal club um, research thing? Is that, is that gonna be individual or partners? That will be individual. Um, I'm open to the idea of doing it in groups. I hadn't thought about that for the first, for the first quarter at least, maybe doing that in, in groups of, of two um, might work. Um, okay. let, me, let me think about that. We'll get, we'll, I'll answer that when we get a little closer to it. Okay. All right, was there anything else syllabus related? Um, it's all stuff we've talked about. All right, here's just one more thing before we take a quick break and then we'll get into actual chemistry. Um, this class is going to be weird. This is, we're not used to doing digital online classes. Um, so I think it's a good idea. We all have an idea for the most part about what the reasonable expectations are for yourself and other students in an in-person class. If you haven't taken online classes, you might not have that. Um, so what are reasonable expectations for, for how we're going to conduct this class? What do you expect from yourself and from other students? Actually putting the time in. Putting the time in? Absolutely. Um, there's nothing more frustrating to me as an as a instructor when somebody comes to office hours and says, I don't get this. And I say, well, what, show me what you've, what you've been thinking about. Show me your notes on it. And they say, oh, I haven't done that yet. Um, you know, put the time in. It's going to take time to get the, get the hang of this stuff. Um, but, you know, there's nothing in here that you guys can't, that you guys can't understand. It's not, it's a different way of thinking. It's weird. But you guys, when you put the time in, talk to each other, talk to me. And you guys can do it. Anything else? What else? chat or unmute yourself either way. Be flexible. Flexible. Yeah. Um, you guys that have had me as a, as a teacher before know I'm pretty flexible with due dates and late work for the most part. Um, you know, my, my rule for late work is, um, you know, every, every lecture that it's late is 10% off. And then, you know, I kind of usually cap that at about 50% off. You'll get at least 50% of the credit. Um, if it's more than five lectures late, which would be two and a half weeks, right? So that's pretty flexible. Um, I think I, I don't remember a lot of uh, instructors doing that. Um, my syllabus is a lot more harsh when it comes to um, to late penalties. But yeah, expect that of, of each other too. Try to remember to be flexible with each other. Work schedules are weird these days. Um, but I'm, I know that most of you guys have probably gone back to work at this point in some capacity. Um, so things are gonna be weird that way. So be flexible with each other, be flexible with me, and I'll return the favor. Um, lots of Khan Academy. Yeah, Khan Academy is gonna be huge. Um, Khan Academy, for those of you guys who don't know, Khan Academy actually got started because Sal Khan was tutoring his niece cross country in organic chemistry. Um, he was trying to help his niece who was taking OCHEM as a pre-med um, from across the country and just started making YouTube videos and sending and posting them and linking his, um, his niece to them. And then she started sharing them with her classmates and it kind of blew up and turned into Khan Academy. Um, but Khan Academy is not great in some areas, but it is great in OCHEM. Lots of good info on info in OCHEM. And you guys are to the point now where you guys are, you know, getting in towards the upper division into classes. So you shouldn't wind up in, you guys might've noticed in Gen Chem or in some classes that Khan Academy goes too much in detail, that they lose you, they show you more than what you need for the class you're in. That's not gonna be true in OCHEM anymore because this is a, this is a high end class. Um, so you guys are going to wanna understand these things at a pretty high level and, and Khan Academy does a pretty good job with that. Clutch prep is good. Um, even things like, I hesitate to recommend this um, based on, on my experiences in the past, but even things like CHEG for ch checking your answers on um, if you don't have access to the solutions manual. Um, I wouldn't pay for any of that because if you guys ask me questions, I'll give you access to the solutions manual if you need it. Um, but if you are just, you know, at home on a Sunday, want to check your answer on something and, you know, CHEG pops up when you Google it, 
um, you know, use the internet. You guys know how to do that by this point. You're, you're what the, uh, the education industry has been calling um, digital natives, um, meaning that you grew up with the internet at this point. Um, and uh, so you guys know pretty well how to Google something and not just take the top result, but kind of find like a good result. Um, and so, yeah, use, use the internet, use Khan Academy, Clutch Prep, email me. Um, and I would add on to this, lost my window, um, to, you guys are already doing a good job of it, but continue to be active in lectures. Um, just because, you know, the more you guys stop me and ask questions, um, the more I have a better handle on where you guys are, how well you're understanding the material, what do we need to spend more time on, what, what metaphor, what analogy did I use that didn't land? If you guys get totally lost when I say analogy, um, I know I should probably go back and revisit that. And uh, if you guys don't, if you guys aren't active, then I don't have a way to gauge that. And I'm just going to keep going. Um, like I, I've said before, those of you guys who've had me as an instructor know that I will keep going at my pace until somebody stops me. Um, so if you want me to slow down, just stop me. And I have no problem slowing down. Sean, actually, I had a question about that. How uh, I haven't used the, the hand raise thing in chat yet. I don't even know how to do that. But do you, what do you prefer how we like, if we have a question, should we just raise our hand in the video? I mean, I don't think you're going to see that. Um, with, with this class, with this class, I will, um, okay. you know, I might, I might miss it, but I'm keeping you, your gallery of you guys up and on my main screen with my slides on my other screen. Um, so I'm watching you guys as, as much as I can, I might miss it here or there, but either just throw something in chat into the chat. Um, and I, and somebody will interrupt me. Um, if, uh, if I miss it, um, or the, the raise your hand function, um, if you look at the zoom toolbar that has the little participants button on it, um, you guys don't have a lot of options for that. But when you click on that, it opens up a list of everybody who's in here. And one of the options down at the bottom should be raise hand. Uh, actually, I'm a little, where's participants? So there's the, the zoom button or the zoom toolbar where you can mute yourself and yeah. unmute yourself. Uh -huh. um, then there's a oh, there, there. Button oh, on okay. the, next to chat usually. Yep. I got um, it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then uh, it doesn't like show flash up a notification necessarily. Um, so again, if I'm, if I miss it, um, don't be afraid to just interrupt me. Um, but yeah, you can try that first. If you're, if you're not comfortable, just jumping in there for, I'm, you know, if I'm going at 60 yeah. miles an hour, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I know you. I just, you know, I don't want to step on anybody. Yeah, so. it's small class. We're all going to be flexible and uh, and do the best we can with this. Don't be afraid to just jump in there. Okay, cool. Um, and so last thing before we take a quick break, what do you guys expect from me? What do you guys want from me in this virtual environment? What's And maybe we'll take a break and you guys can think about that and we'll come back and brainstorm some ideas. Um, so let's take a 10-minute break. Uh, let's come back at 5 after 9. Freshen up your coffee, brush your teeth, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I'll see you guys at five after.
All right, let's go ahead and come on back here. Sure, I was responding to emails, got a little bit lost there, but you guys are all back on time. Thank you. Um, all right, so what what are some reasonable expectations for me as a teacher in this class? What do you guys want from me? Kind of an open-ended question. While you're thinking about I have yeah. something. I mean, this is just pulling back from my time with you um, last year. Mm -hmm. um, and to go back to what you were saying about having questions, some, you know, like sometimes with um, some stuff last year that I was trying to understand, even just getting that first step was like the hard part for me. And, and I, and you certainly did ask me sometimes like, what, what have you done? But it was, I certainly did think about it and try to think about it, but it was like, I really have done nothing because my train of thought really didn't go anywhere. And that's how I felt sometimes. So, so, you know, like just maybe not even the help, but maybe just like that first hint, you know, like kind of the other way that you were talking about that first hit might just propel me to get number two and then so on. Yeah. And, and I'm definitely, I know I, I was saying, make sure you put in the work before you come to office hours, but I definitely don't want to intimidate you guys or you feel like you can't come to office hours because you don't even know where to start. That, yeah, that was yeah. not my intention is, um, you know, and like RJ was saying, you know, a lot of times it's just a matter of, Sometimes even just formulating the question is enough to, to get you guys to, to think, change how you're thinking about it. So when you do, you know, feel free to come to office hours, but I'm, um, all I was trying to say is don't walk into office hours with, I don't get this, try and have a, try to formulate a specific question on some level. Like, even if it's, can we go through that example we did in class again, you know, even something at that level. It's just when it's super open ended, um, those in office hours, it's less of a, of a headache too. It's, um, I'm mostly drawing from experience from students who their week of finals will send me an email saying things like, I don't understand equilibrium when we've been doing equilibrium for the past three months. Um, that those kind of open ended, I don't understand questions is what I'm trying to avoid, but it, you know, like, I really don't understand where you started with this problem even if it's just a specific problem, just have thought about it and try to formulate it into a, into thought at least a little bit um, when you come in there. And it's not like I'm ever going to kick you out or refuse to answer a question. If you do come in, I'm, I'm just trying to help you guys help yourselves too. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else? What else can I do for you guys? What else is going to help you guys with this? Um, I Olivia. feel like, I mentioned the academy, <clears throat> but maybe um, besides the textbooks, if I do like academy, it walks you through it. Maybe like linking, um, like helpful videos like that <clears throat> would be good if, if you have the time. Yeah, um, I I will definitely um, do my best to to post some. Khan Academy videos or any other videos that, you know, if I've, um, you know, maybe um, it might be helpful if I, if I record some videos, work walking through the, some examples on some of your homework problems um, just on my whiteboard and just post them. Or if I find good videos that are relevant to what we're doing from, from other sources, I'll post those links as I, as I find them. Um, and speaking of which I did also post a link to that nature article about uh, phosphine in Venus. Um, at least the abstract, I think everybody, you guys can could read and understand what's going on, it's why it's so cool. Uh, Olivia, did you have something too? Yeah, I was just gonna say patience and then um, also flexibility from, from your end as well as ours, like we talked about. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I think those are all reasonable expectations. Those are all things I'm going to continue to, to try and do. Um, does anybody, if you guys wanted to add anything else on, certainly can, but um, yeah, we've, I think at this point we have a, a decent idea of what, what this class is going to look like to some degree. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. And this is a fluid list as well. So feel free to, if something's not working for you for whatever reason, something I'm doing or you're, feel, you know, even if you can't put your finger on what it is, just, you can be something vague, like the, 
the way you're posting the lecture videos is not working for me. I don't know what, I, you know, even if you don't have a suggestion necessarily, let me know that there's a problem there and, and we'll see if we can find something that we can do differently. Sorry, I think I missed that. I think you just keep doing what you normally do and it'll work just fine, man. I'll do uh, our regular um, in-person classes as best I can. The labs is where we're really going to be weird. Um, but lectures are going to work pretty much the way they normally would. I even have a real whiteboard, like I was saying, in a, a decent webcam. Once I get my computer operational again, then um, then we'll be we'll be good to go on that front and uh, and try and keep it, you know, and give you guys lots. What what will change on about this class from in person is um, instead of focusing on doing lots of in class examples where you guys where we just stop and you guys do examples, and then we go over it together. Um, we will still do some of that, but I will have, there will be more assignments. Usually I would just do that and it would just sort of be in your notes. You wouldn't necessarily have to turn anything in. Um, there will probably be a few more assign homework assignments than normal. I think when I was looking at, at uh, last year's Canvas shell, there were only like three homework assignments for this class. Most of it was just those quizzes and doing, doing examples in groups in class. Um, that's a little bit harder for me to help you guys out to see what you're doing, you guys to work in groups and that kind of thing. Um, so there will be a few more assignments, but it'll be about the same amount of work um, as as last year, um, as last year's OCHEM class. It'll be less work than your Gen Chem class. There were a lot of assignments in Gen Chem, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we'll definitely try to keep things as, as normal as possible. Okay, and, and just to be clear, um, like from a week to week basis, we should pretty much expect the same type of assignments every week like a quiz every weekend and then two quiz, labs or yeah. other labs. Yeah, quiz every week. Um, there'll be some form of a lab assignment every week. If it's a long one that I wasn't anticipating, I might extend it to do to go two weeks for some of these, especially um, when we get into interpreting these spectra. Um, they can be, it's really easy for me to assign a, a, um, a lab assignment that is a lot longer than I think it's going to take you guys. Um, so if that ever does happen, then then deadlines will be a little bit uh, fluid that way and flexible. But yeah, you know, at least we'll be doing a lab assignment of some sort, even if it's a continuation of the previous week and a quiz every week. And then we'll kind of um, we will add homework assignments in kind of as as I see a need based on your quiz results mostly. Um, but also if it just feels like you guys just want more practice with something, then I'll then I'll grab some practice problems from the textbook and, and put together an assignment for you. Um, okay, and then, and then the in the lecture, the in-class lecture assignment, so mm -hmm. if that is that can be kind of, that's going to be homework too, I'm assuming, kind of, or is that um, going to be during lecture? If, if I do, if I do something like that, that's, that's frequently what I would normally do in an in-person would be like, you know, if we end on a, on a tough example or run out of time to finish an example in class, I'll say, okay, do this one as homework and we'll go over at the beginning of class next lecture. And I might not make that a full assignment um, that you actually have to submit. It would just be like, you know, it's sort of like a history class where you're supposed to have done your reading before you show up to lecture. It's, you're supposed to have done this problem before you show up to lecture, but I'm not necessarily going to make you turn it in. Um, I might make a few more of those actual assignments this year since I'm not going to see you in person is all I was saying with that. But they will show up in Canvas as assignments. I'm not going to surprise you guys. If you guys are watching the assignments in Canvas, then you'll see everything, um, even, even if I'm adding it in, you know, on a week-to-week -week basis. Does that make, does that sound reasonable? All right. And then one of my favorite... Uh, Favorite quotes about hard work. Um, the best things in life are not free, but the best things in life are beyond money. Their price is agony and sweat and devotion. You give me agony, sweat and devotion. You work hard in this class, you're going to do great and you're going to get, you're going to understand OCHEM at a level that's well beyond what most, most um, pre-health students do. You guys are going to be all over it. Um, but Robert Heinlein is um, he's the author of Starship Troopers. He's really, really famous and well-known sci-fi author. He's um, wrote a bunch of other books that have been turned into movies. Um, he's also off the reservation, but he's a good writer and has some good ideas sometimes. Um, 
the moon is the harsh mistress is one of his uh one of is a is a pretty good site if you like sci-fi books um the, it's a, it's about turning the moon into australia as a penal colony um and then the the moon fighting for for uh freedom you know a war of independence from the moon versus earth perspective which is very interesting and he actually does the, the science relatively well um but again guys nutter but entertaining Anyway, let's talk about some, some uh, chemistry here. <clears throat> the idea with this, um, with this, sorry, I'm trying to move my toolbar. I'm not sure. Can you guys see the toolbar or is it in your way? Okay. Um, with this part, we're just going to go over all the stuff in Gen Chem that's relevant to OCHEM. We're going to get ourselves into an OCHEM frame of mind because most of the stuff you guys did in OCHEM or in Gen Chem is not all that relevant to OCHEM. We're basically taking a subset of a few big ideas um, and just expanding them and exploring them to their, their full extent. Um, but a lot of the stuff we're not going from Gen Chem, we're not necessarily going to look at. We're not going to look at cell potentials and voltages or anything like that. Um, so here's our, our basic idea is that the Bohr model is going to be where we start when it comes to these, um, to these models of the atom. And it's just the idea that the Bohr model was that you have electrons and a nucleus, your two main components of in any atom. Um, and it's going to be, and those, the nucleus and the electrons are kind of have the, the two main properties of matter are that it takes up space and that it has mass. And one of these two components, electrons versus, um, let me see if I can get my laser pointer. So electrons make up one of those components, they take up the volume, and the nucleus has all the mass within sig figs. Basically, we can, we can treat electrons as though they don't have any mass for the most part, because they're so small compared to the nucleus. And we can treat the nucleus like it is basically just a point in space. It's not even a real, doesn't even have any volume because it's so small compared to the electron clouds. Um, the good analogy I, that I like is if you went to um, what's now Oracle Park, the, the Giants um, field in San Francisco, um, the entire park would be about the size of, of an atom's um, electrons then the nucleus would be the size of the baseball at the pitcher's mound. To give you an idea of just how big the difference in size is. So an entire stadium is your electron cloud versus tiny little baseball right in the middle is your nucleus. But almost all of the mass um, is, is inside that nucleus, that tiny little volume. Um, so we can say that the nucleus is both tiny and huge. Now go over to some things that from Gen Chem that you probably wish you didn't have to see again. Um, orbitals are going to play a big role in OCHEM because everything that reacts is reacting because electrons are moving from place to place. Orbitals are changing shape. Things are gaining charges. The nuclei are so heavy that they basically don't move at all. Um, that's actually what, um, you know, you guys probably all heard of Oppenheimer. Um, Oppenheimer was the director of the Manhattan Project in World War II um, that, that uh, designed the um, atomic bomb. Uh, Oppenheimer, just, most people don't know why he was actually so, so well regarded that he got put in charge of it. He was the one who came up with the mathematical simplification in quantum that allows you to say basically the, the electrons are so much smaller that at the same temperature, we can basically say that the nucleus doesn't move. Um, he, along with his advisor, Max Born, so it's called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, is basically nuclei don't move, only electrons move. Because the nuclei are so much heavier, um, it's it, for the same amount of energy, if you think about a golf ball and a bowling ball that have the same amount of energy, the golf ball is gonna be going really fast compared to that bowling ball. So within sig figs, you can just treat the bowling ball like it's not moving. You treat the nucleus like it's not moving. Um, so most of what we're going to be going over is going to deal with the electrons moving. Um, and so we can get more specific from the Bohr model and take those energy levels 
and divide them into orbitals of different types. So in the second energy level, you have your 2s orbital that can hold two electrons. Then you have your p orbital that has three different shapes that make up um, the p orbital. And each of those shapes can hold two electrons. Um, this is ringing bells for electron configurations. We might not have specifically looked at these shapes in a lot of detail, but we did spend a lot of time saying, okay, 2p, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Um, and so the way that we fill these is was basically that the first parts of um, of or of quantum mechanics is that. Um, is the rules for filling up these orbitals. As you add electrons to a system, they're always going to fill up these orbitals in a predictable way. Um, so the first one, the first principle is called the Aufbau principle, um, which in German literally means building up. Aufbau does, apparently. I've never taken German, but I'm told. Um, and just says that you fill up the lowest energy electrons first. You know, the, those lowest energy orbitals are going to be filled up before the higher energy orbitals, which sort of makes sense. If you're, fill, if you're putting water into a bucket, it has to fill the bottom of the bucket before it can fill up the top of the bucket, right? That's similar to adding electrons into a quantum system. The difference is we have these different layers, these different discrete energy levels, as opposed to just continuously filling up the bucket. Um, so that would just mean that we fill up this 1s orbital before we put any electrons into the 2s orbital. Um, and the Pauli exclusion principle, this is Wolfgang Pauli. Um, he basically says that you electrons have to have unique quantum numbers, which basically means you can't have electrons in the same space as other electrons. So you can't have an infinite number of electrons in the 1s energy level. Once it's been filled up, once you have two electrons in the 1s orbital, one spin up and one spin down, the next electron that you add into the system has to go to a higher energy level because it can't, it can't, you can't continuously add electrons in there. Um, and if you've ever heard of um, bosons versus fermions, um, that's sort of the physics definition, the particle physics definition of it is is that there are certain particles called bosons where you can have them all together um, in the same state and in the same place for the most part without violating this principle. Um, but electrons are not bosons, they're fermions, which means that they can't be in the same place at the same time with the same properties. Um, so this is just the rule that you can only put two electrons per orbital. And then Frederick, Friedrich Hund, um, Hund's rule says that if you have orbitals that are the same energy, which we call degenerate, degenerate orbitals, um, you're going to fill up each of the orbitals with one electron before you start doubling up. So it's think about people that don't know each other getting on a bus. You're going to fill up all the seats on the bus with one person before people voluntarily start doubling up, right? So that's what Hund's rule is. You're going to put one electron into each of these spots before you add the second electron with the opposite spin. Um, and then, so also worth noting at this point, um, chemistry is a field that you may have noticed something about Hund and Pauli and all of these founding fathers of organic chemistry. They're all old white dudes. Um, chemistry in general and specifically organic chemistry is pretty much all based around a framework that was kind of described, started being described in the 1800s in Europe. Um, and that was where, where the, there was knowledge of chemistry and there was a drive to increasing um, knowledge there because people that had knowledge about chemistry kind of tended to occupy higher levels in the social system. It was all well-educated people. It was started from alchemists, which were always advisors, usually advisors to kings and rulers. Um, so they tended to be well-educated. They tend to be very wealthy. They tend to have free time, um, which you didn't have in a lot of different parts of the world, even in lower classes in Europe. Um, and so it always tended to look like this. You had um, Wohler and Kakuli and Nobel and 
Cobb, um, three of these, Wohler, Kakuli, and Cobb, were all German. Nobel was Swedish. Um, and then if we keep adding in these, these founding fathers are going to wind up all being Northern European and white and dudes. Um, that got really boring. Um, eventually, we started running out of ideas from old white dudes in Europe. Um, and we start getting a lot more interesting ideas in the, in the 1900s. Um, but there was definitely resistance. Chemistry has notoriously been a gatekeeping science. Um, that's one of the reasons that people um, have to take organic chemistry, despite the fact you might never use organic chemistry again if you go into you know, nursing. Um, and it was basically because you could rely on chemistry to decide who was worthy of continuing on. Um, and that's led to people picking people that looked like them. Um, we're moving away from that these days. I can't do anything about the fact that the people that did all of the fundamental research that we're going to learn we're all old white dudes, but I do want to point out there's been a lot of more um, practice or a lot of ideas that have come from other places. Here's just some info on these guys. Friedrich Wohler first synthesized urea. The reason it's called organic chemistry um, is because back in the day they thought that anything that was living um, had made these organic compounds and anything that was non-living or inorganic couldn't make these same compounds. So Wohler actually was an inorganic chemist who accidentally made urea in the lab, um, which was an organic, they knew was an organic chemical that occurred in living organisms. Um, so he was the first one to say, well, maybe it's not just about living things make these carbon-based compounds and everything else um, is inorganic. He was the one who first said maybe organic chemistry is more than just life. They called it vitalism, the idea that some compounds had life and some compounds didn't. Um, was purely accidental. Um, Kikuli actually came up with the idea of the structure for benzene. Um, he, he claims it came to him in a dream where he dreamt about the Ouroboros, which is an ancient Egyptian idea. It's the snake that devours its own tail. Um, and so it's, a, it's where we get the symbol for infinity in mathematics is, is a symbol of the Ouroboros devouring its own tail. Um, and he had a vision that in his dream that benzene was like that. The electrons were in a circle devouring their own tail. Um, Alfred Nobel, um, we know mostly for his Nobel Prize, he also invented dynamite, nitroglycerin. Um, his own brother died in an, in an accident in his um, factory that where they were making nitroglycerin because he dropped a drop of nitroglycerin in a nitroglycerin factory. Um, and the whole, and something like 42 people died or something like that, um, including um, Nobel's own brother. And then he had his change of heart and founded the Nobel Prizes um, when somebody accidentally um, published an obituary, obituary about him when he was still alive. His brother, his other brother died um, and, uh, and a newspaper thought it was Alfred Nobel and published an obituary that called him the merchant of death because of all the destruction that nitroglycerin and dynamite had caused. Um, and that really, had, he had a, uh, like, whoa, you know, what about my legacy moment? Like, I don't want, people to remember me as the merchant of death. And so he founded the Nobel Prizes. Um, and then you've got Herman Cobb, which he was one of the really important figures in early organic chemistry, but he was such a jackass, um, for lack of a better term. He was so angry and bitter and racist um, that he doesn't even get taught very much anymore. He was a contemporary of Wohler. They actually made similar discoveries at about the same time, but we teach about Wohler instead of Cobb because of Cobb's. Um, he was a, an editor at a journal, that, a major journal of chemistry that basically would refuse to publish any uh, research that was done by anybody um, who wasn't German and white and male. Um, and he was very, very vocal about that, that German, white male Germans were better at organic chemistry than everyone else, and therefore he wasn't going to publish anything. RJ? I'm sorry, this is a kind of a tangent, but um, like winners write history, right? So at, at some point, does any of their um, research or what they found, has anyone found something that didn't agree with what they had said before? Um, this, that's one of the things that, that I was, when I was 
when you look at the history of chemistry specifically in math and in physics, it was, there was, you can see math and physics showing up in different cultures independently of each other. You know, lots of big mathematicians in India and in Persia and physicists too, for that matter, that were independent of Western thought. You don't see that for chemistry because chemistry really is based upon some of these fundamental ideas that were discovered for as far as we know, um, entirely in Europe first. And then it spread based on the timing of when that was discovered. And then as colonialism happened, and then as global travel became more common and communication ideas became more common, that's sort of what led to the domination of chemistry by Europe and American scientists. It was just a kind of an, an accident. If we'd been studying chemistry, as long as we'd been studying physics, if that was something that people had started studying thousands of years ago instead of hundreds of years ago, we would probably see it independently showing up in other places, almost certainly. Um, but based on the timing of these discoveries and the human race as a, as a whole, um, it, you don't see that too much. It's starting to spread out now more. Um, uh, Marie Curie is, everybody's heard of Marie Curie. Most of you guys might not know that she was um, she was a Polish immigrant to France. We think of Marie Curie being, as being French. She was actually Polish, um, and she moved to France without even speaking French um, because Poland wouldn't allow women to study science. So she moved to France, where they were a little bit more liberal. You could go to college as a woman, and she studied science. But then she, when she wanted to get her doctorate, even France wasn't li that liberal yet. And so she still wasn't allowed to continue her studies until she found an advisor that would basically like publish everything for her um, under his name um, and allow her to continue her research. Um, but uh, yeah, she's fascinating life story her, um, you know, she met her husband in doing her research, shared a Nobel prize with him. He died in his thirties because he got hit by a car, not from anything radio radiation related. Um, it's like 1906 in, in Paris. So there's like five cars and he manages to get run over by one of them. Um, and then her daughters, one of her daughters won Nobel prize of her own for work on radioactivity. Um, and her other daughter um, fought in the French revolution with our French resistance um, in uh, during world war II was a journalist in during world war II who uh, stayed in Paris when Marie, when her sister evacuated to the, to the U S she stayed in Paris to, uh, lead a resistance cell um, during World War II and then became um, very influential in the formation of the UN following World War II. Um, so really fascinating life story. Um, Percy Julian is another really famous, or he, his work doesn't get taught as much as it should be um, because he's black and from the South and, and he's, his work was in this, the synthesis of uh, hormones like steroids. He was one of the first people, he was the first um, African American to have a PhD in chemistry. Um, and his work had to do with synthesizing steroids. Um, so things like um, birth control. Um, he was one of the people that founded a lot of the, the synthesis pathways that are used still today in um, making things like testosterone supplements and orthotricycline and things like that. Um, cholesterol medications. Um, it's all based on his research, but it doesn't get taught very much. Um, and same with, with uh, Fukui here. He, he did similar research to somebody who won a Nobel Prize 20 years before he did. He was a contemporary of this person, worked with this person who was, a, who was you know, go figure, white and German. Um, and they were working on quantum mechanics together in the 1950s. Um, and the, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. Um, we'll get to them eventually, um, got a Nobel Prize in the late 60s, and he got a Nobel Prize in 1981 um, for doing the same research at the same time. But so we're getting there. And then I actually doing this, setting up this slide, found out about Asima Chatterjee. Um, I had never heard about her. She basically is the founder of ethnobotany, which is the idea that you can take, um, if you look at traditional um, plant-based remedies from different cultures around the world, you can isolate certain compounds from those. They might have some good pharmaceutical properties. Um, so the same way that the one of the oldest examples is taking willow bark and making a tea from it 
um, extracts salicylic acid, which can then be treated to make um, acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. Um, so that'd be an example. Willow bark tea is, is a remedy in many different cultures around the world um, for things like headaches. Um, and so ethnobotany is the idea that you can take some of these naturally occurring compounds, isolate them from their plant sources, and then um, there might be some good pharmaceutical use there. And she basically founded that field. She did a lot of work in uh, cucumarins, um, which are also found in saffron and um, lots of other um, really important uh, botanical ex extracts. And then we can't talk about all the good things that chemistry has done without also mentioning the fact that organic chemistry has killed a lot of people. Um, Richard Kuhn is a Nazi. Um, he was one of the first scientists to jump on Hitler's bandwagon. And basically, as soon as Hitler was elected, he fired everybody that worked for him who was Jewish um, and you know, started throwing Zig Heils into his talks to other scientists. Um, and then, and not all of the, the chemists were as outspoken as Kuhn, but a lot of German scientists, which is where a lot of this Ochem was happening, basically used the fact that Hitler would throw money at them to advance their own research, even though they knew it was being used for negative things. So nerve gases, um, you know, um, what's his name? Warner von Braun is famous for saying, well, I'm just designing the V2 rocket. I'm not gonna pay attention to where it lands um, because he just wanted, he took Hitler's money um, for his research and ignored the fact that Hitler was building these V2 rockets to bomb London from Germany. Um, so, you know, we can't, can't address orga organic chemistry without bringing up the fact that a lot of negative things have happened um, and do better to not let that happen next time. Um, you know, organic chemists, chemists in general need to do a better job. And I think when it comes to climate change, we're scientists are doing a pretty good job of being outspoken and not just kind of letting things happen. But um, worth noting, given the fact that uh, the contributions of women and people of color have been glossed over for so long in the sciences. Um, but we do still have to build on those old white people's ideas first. Um, so if we wanted to build an electron configuration based on this, we'd follow these three principles. Start at the bottom, work your way up. Only two electrons per line, per molecular orbital. You can only have, if you have degenerate orbitals, you have to fill all of them up with one electron before you double up. So for carbon, it would look like you fill up the 1s orbital. There's two electrons. How many electrons does carbon have? You get my periodic table on the on uh, my whiteboard behind me. Um, so carbon's got a total of six electrons, right? So we use two. That's two arrows. They're not supposed to blend in together like that. Um, drawing with a mouse is hard. There's four electrons, and there's two more. And that's where Hun's rule comes in. You don't double up. You put them in this. Put one electron by itself before you double them up. Right, so the other aspect to this is this is helpful because it allows us to predict when things are going to get more stable. Um, and so when the state, these electron orbitals are most stable once they're full or all the way empty, partially filled orbitals are not stable. Right, so this allows us to use the periodic table to predict how many electrons something needs to gain or lose to become stable. Fluorine, for instance, has seven electrons. No, it has nine electrons um, when you count the 1s orbital. And then, so that means in order to become more stable, it needs to gain one more electron, right? Which would mean that fluorine is most, most stable at, with a negative one charge, right? So it's been a while, but this should be all pretty familiar to everybody, right? And if I gave you this electron configuration, we should be able to use a periodic table to figure out what that is, even just by counting the electrons. But it, 
it's going to look very similar to fluorine, right? It still also needs to only gain one electron. So if you go, if you add one more energy level onto fluorine, you're going down one row on the periodic table. So what's right underneath fluorine on the periodic table? It's going to be chlorine. Right? And so we see a lot of similar properties between chlorine and fluorine because they both are going to have that similar, they both need to gain one electron to have a full energy level. They're, that's why they line up underneath each other on the periodic table. For the most part for this class, we're only going to care about the first row, first two rows of the periodic table. We'll throw chlorine in there, sulfur in there occasionally, but for the most part, organic chemists care about nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and that's about it. Um, so you aren't going to need a periodic table consistently in this class. It's always a good idea to have one around, though. Um, you guys don't do as much chemistry as I do, but what I found helpful is I just make the periodic table a uh, copy of the periodic table my desktop. So if I need a periodic table, I just minimize everything, write down what I need, go back to what I was doing, um, since I don't have a lot of wall space. All evidence to the contrary. All right. If we want to do a Lewis dot structure, this is going to be a lot more common to what we're going to do in this class. We find our total valence electrons. We figure out what the center atom is going to be, which for organic chemistry, we're frequently going to have more than one central atom. Um, and so we'll get better and better doing these Lewis dot structures in a way that's more specific to organic chemistry. Um, you place the remaining atoms around the central atom, and then position the electrons so that everything has a full valence. So two most important rules for Lewis dot structures is one, you have to have the right number of electrons. And two, did you fill the valences of everything? So I'll switch to away from the slide share so you guys can maybe read that, hopefully. Um, is that clear enough to read? Just testing out this. Okay. So if we wanted to do, we'll just do a couple of these um, so we can go a couple more slides today. If we want to do CH4 methane, start by... We'll start by counting your valence electrons. So carbon has four valence electrons, and then there are four hydrogens, each that brings one valence electron. So that's a total of eight valence electrons. So then if, we, if we're trying to decide what's going to be the central atom, it's usually going to be, it's got, it has to be something with more than one vacancy. Anything that's only has one vacancy in its outermost shell, like hydrogen or like fluorine or like chlorine, is only going to have um, one, one bond to it. It's only going to share one electron. So you're never going to have fluorine or hydrogen be the central atom. So if your choice is carbon or hydrogen, you put carbon in the middle. Usually you can go, it's going to be determined by electronegativity. Whatever's most electronegative, whatever's least electronegative goes in the middle because more electronegative means it won't share as much. So if we surround carbon with the hydrogens, we need to then place our eight electrons so that everything has a full valence. In this case, it's pretty straightforward because we only have eight electrons and carbon needs eight electrons in its valence, right? So you're going to start by just bonding all the atoms to the carbon and then count how many electrons you used. Each of these bonds represents two electrons. So we've used eight electrons now, which means that's all we had to do. So we satisfied criteria one. We used the right number of electrons. Then we check criteria two. Did we have, do we fill everything's valence? In this case, we did. Hydrogen only needs one, two electrons because it's in the first energy level. Carbon needs eight valence electrons, which it has. Right, so again, that 
should all be pretty familiar. Hopefully it's a little boring, um, but I just want to remind you what we're doing with these before we move on because Lewis dot structures wind up being really important here once we start talking about the, where's, there it is, um, once we start talking about geometries. And so in OCHEM, we kind of switch our frame of reference. Instead of um, saying, oh, using these two criteria of use the right number of electrons and then fill everything's valence, we assume that everything's going to be neutral. We assume that every atom is going to have a full valence unless other, otherwise specified. So instead of explicitly stating these things, how many electrons we have and that everything has a full valence, we're going to assume that that's true. And instead of, um, instead of needing to draw the entire structure, that, that allows us to say, okay, we can predict the number of bonds something will have, number of covalent bonds an element will have based on the number of vacancies that it will have as opposed to needing to go through this whole process. We, we can just assume that unless, if carbon doesn't have a charge, it has to have the same number of bonds every time. It's gonna have four bonds. It's got four vacant spots. It needs to gain four electrons to have that full energy level. So rather than thinking about it in terms of how many electrons does it need to gain and then adding everything up and redistributing the electrons, we can just say, okay, carbon, if it's neutral, has four bonds. Um, that's, we can do that for anything in the first row, right? In the second row of the periodic table, nitrogen's got five valence electrons already, which means it's got three vacancies, which means we can say that nitrogen is going to generally form three bonds. It's going to form three bonds unless it has a charge or an incomplete valence. If it has a charge or an incomplete valence, that's not necessarily going to be true, but you're going to have more information to go off. They're, they have to tell you something. They either have to draw it like it, um, as a free radical, which for um, for carbon or for organic chemistry, a free radical, we're going to draw that basically by drawing a single electron by itself. So unless you're told otherwise by writing up your structure like this, the abbreviated form would, would look like just a, CH3 with a dot next to it, that's called a methyl radical because it doesn't have a, it has an unpaired electron. So unless you're given extra information, like it has a charge or it's got an unpaired electron, we can just generalize and say, this atom makes this many bonds. No, we're running out of time here. We might use some of the lecture today to to get a couple more slides done on this um, because your lab today is um, basically going to be practice using um, online tools to draw molecules in a way that looks professional, um, which is a good skill for everybody to have. So I think we'll start off that by doing a few more of these slides so we can get to the point um, where the assignment makes sense. So a couple more ideas before we, we end it for real, real quick. So if we have a nitrogen with four bonds, what has to be true about this system? If you count up the number of, of electrons, where's my... Does that have more than eight valence electrons? Is nitrogen going to have a negative charge? It's got to have something, something weird's got to be going on. It's either got, so if you count up, nitrogen's got five valence electrons, right? And then each hydrogen is supposed to bring one electron. So that would be a total of nine electrons, right? But nitrogen can't have nine electrons in its valence shell. So, and hydrogen can't have more than two. So, and that's, this brings up, the cardinal rule of organic chemistry is if it's in the second row of the periodic table, especially if it's a carbon, it will never, and I almost never use that, you know, definites like that. It will never have more than eight electrons. You can't have more than eight electrons. If it's on the second row of the periodic table. So the fact that when we add up the number of electrons here and we get nine, that means that 
there's got to have there's got to be a charge on this nitrogen for this to be stable because we're missing an electron, right? It's supposed to be nine. There's only eight drawn. So this compound has a positive charge. The other way you can think about it is instead of looking at the entire compound as well, it must, it must have a positive charge. We can also count the bonds. Nitrogen normally forms three bonds, right? And it has one lone pair that's not explicitly drawn here in this figure. That's supposed to represent an electron cloud. Um, so if nitrogen normally forms three bonds, if you make it form four bonds instead, it's sharing electrons more than it wants to, right? It's most stable with three bonds. So four bonds means that it's got a positive charge. So instead of thinking of this entire molecule as having a positive charge, we can think of it as the nitrogen has a positive charge. So anytime you've got something that's forming more bonds than it wants to, it's going to be a positive charge on it. So oxygen with three bonds instead of two has a positive charge. And the opposite is true as well. Anything that's got fewer bonds but still has a full valence is going to have a negative charge because it's, we're going to assume it's got that full valence. So if it's got a full valence but not the same number of bonds as normal, it has more electrons than it's used to. So a nitrogen with two bonds would be negative. Oxygen with one bond would be negative. Carbon with three bonds is a little bit tricky because carbon, it turns out, can have an incomplete valence sometimes. So carbon with three bonds can be a positive charge or a negative charge, depending on the situation. But we'll get into all that later. We're going to end it there for now. And like I said, come show up to lecture or to lab at 1.30, right? No, 3.30. Um, and we'll, we'll do a few more slides, and then I'll turn you guys loose. If you guys wanted, wanted to start reading through the assignment and, and get um, try it out a little bit um, beforehand. If you have time, go for it. Um, otherwise, I'll walk you guys through it after we, we cover a few more concepts. Any questions before we're, we're done for a few hours? Uh, um, where are the lectures on Canvas? I can't find them. Or the Good. lecture slides. Let me pull up Canvas. So I'll go to the home page and let me make sure, I'll go to student view and make sure that I can see that if you click on week one, Um, it's got basically a list of things we're going to do this week, and then below that, your lecture one slides. Can you guys see that? Make sure. Okay. And then, like I said, when I get a chance later today, I'll put the video post. The links will be right here, too. I'm just going to host everything on YouTube because everybody knows how YouTube works. Um, and uh, we'll go there. But All right. Have a good uh, morning, and I will see you guys at 3.30. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. See you later. Yeah. Oops.